today, right here, right now, this is the moment that you will finally say... I'm growing my accounting practice, and you're going to discover exactly how right here, right now, on the Grow My Accounting Practice podcast, episode 182. Woo! Welcome, everyone. Yes, welcome, everyone. I'm Ron Saharian, co-founder of Profit First Professionals. And I'm Mike Michalowicz, the author of Profit First, along with some other books like Clockwork. And you, my friends, are listening to GMAP. You know what that stands for? Grow My Accounting Practice. This is a show where we teach you the step-by-step how to do exactly that. Grow your accounting or bookkeeping practice. We give you action steps. We give you insider access. We give you, and it's the only show on the planet that gives you the GMAP Now task. The one task that will drive your business forward. But the best part is we have amazing interviews. And today, we're going to be talking about using outsourced services. It's the way to scale. You're yep. going to all the insights. I'm excited about that. And let's not forget about your, your book, The Pumpkin Plan, Mike. Thank about you, niches in the riches, or riches in the niches, yeah. which is unbelievable and it's a part of the curriculum here that we teach at profit first professionals you know it's funny that phrase does work both ways so riches in the niches would be pick a niche and you get rich but niches in the riches are once you have wealth where to target it it's like an investment there you go i love it there you go and of course you guys can find us on itunes stitcher TuneIn radio google play and of course grow my accounting practice.com and, and let's not forget alexa. alexa yeah have you tried it yet i you, don't have alexa oh when you go out there, just go, Alexa. My, my, uh, my, my television still has a uh, remote, still has a cord to it. <laughs> we used to have a remote. Ours is still a dial. So um, <laughs> you can go to the Alexa we have in uh, where Kelsey sits here uh-huh. and say, uh, Alexa, play the Grow My Accounting Practice podcast. And I'm like, playing episode 182. Nice. Yeah, her voice gets all wacky. Like Alexa, that. play Profit First Professionals. Oh, no, <laughs> Alexa, play grow my accounting practice. I don't I like even that. know what I'm doing. No, I like that. You just hired a profit first professional there you go. through your Alexa. All right, guys. Um, well, you know what we're going to be talking about today is about outsourcing. Before we do that, I do want to uh, thank our corporate partners to make the show a reality, Ron. Yes. Thank you, Nextiva. Thank you, Receipt Bank. And as of us recording this today, mm-hmm. I am flying out tonight to Phoenix. Uh-huh. Going to spend a afternoon with the or a morning with the team at Nextiva. Nice. Yeah, they're just you're going out there later in the Fly- year too, right? Yeah, I go to Phoenix. It's interesting. When, you know, for speaking, you go to like three or four locations regularly. Right. Phoenix is a big convention area. Right. Vegas is. Um, New York, shockingly, is not right because of the weather. I think the weather and the affordability of uh, the affordability. hotels and the availability of hotels, but that but that's why we have our global conference in New Jersey. Right, get people out here. Yeah, where George Washington was. All right. <laughs> um, uh, but, but, but we thanked our corporate partners. Uh, we talked about what we're going to share later. I think we're ready to get right into it, Ron. Absolutely. Okay. His name is Lawrence Whitman. Lawrence helped with the QXAS, that's QX Accounting, U.S. expansion from the U.K. to the U.S. back in 2014. Lawrence played a vital role in growing QXAS to a team of over 80 accountants, working with over 200-plus CPAs and accounting firms in the U.S. He has ex- He's an experienced traveler who's worked in eight countries. Mm, that's the big takeaway here. You're going to learn how outsourcing isn't necessarily in your own country. You can use out external. And here's the guy who knows it and uh, has been extensively working with uh, businesses in both the uh, U.S. and in India. One thing you may not know, but we were talking about his accent earlier, is he's born in England. A lot of Americans say, oh, you're born in London. They think like New York is the U.S. They equate the same. Born in England, but he's born in North North England in Yorkshire. Um, and you also hear a little bit of an Irish accent. Well, this is uh, Lawrence second appearance oh, that's right. on GMAP. Yeah, and uh, full disclosure, our members use QXAS regularly. A large portion of our membership is scaling their business by working with this trusted partner of ours and helping them scale their organization. Well, with no further ado, Lawrence, welcome to the show. Oh, my. Hey, guys. How you doing? Good. Hey, did QX just expand into Canada recently? We did. We did. We've actually got about a team of 25 accountants now working for we've only got about five firms but they've grown uh, very very quickly actually so let's just get to the base of what outsourcing is when it comes into the accounting world like what does a firm like qx do specifically for accounting practices yeah so it's majorly about an option to scale the business so it's obviously in the u.s we have a huge resourcing problem especially in the accounting industry there just isn't enough accountants now that are qualified or experienced enough to do the work 
And so utilizing an outsourcing firm allows you to take on a full-time staff member or take on part-time help as needed. Um, and it gives you just that flexibility for growth. Okay. And, um, but, but there's so many risks and, and I shouldn't say risks. There's so many perceived risks though of outsourcing. So uh, I know a lot of our members say that'd be interesting, but. Well, not, not only are there perceived risks, there's, a, a, I think, a misunderstanding of how to work with an outsourcer. It, it, when you say outsource, right, when we outsource our marketing, right. we're outsourcing it. We, we maybe have our hands in it a little bit, right. but pretty much we're allowing that agency to do what they're best at. Yeah. That's different than then, working yeah. with an outsource provider like, QXAS. So why don't we dig into both those? Tell us, what are the perceived risks have, and then what's the actuality or the reality behind that? Yeah, so I think that exactly like you've just given that example with the marketing side of it, so I think that type of risk is more of a reputation risk that you're putting on the line, essentially. Mm. So you're relying on a marketing firm to be able to promote your company as though you want it to be. Okay, compared to in the accounting industry, in the tax industry, obviously we've got a lot of security risks. Uh, we've got a lot of a sensitive data that is going out there. So we just need to make sure that everything's secure. Um, and that's where the sort of perceived thoughts behind it is a bit misconstrued in a way, uh, just because people think that it's not as secure, for example. But generally speaking, you are gonna be working with, you need to do your background research. I mean, that's the first thing. Mm -hmm. but you can work with some very, very high level firms, outsourcing firms that have spent millions of dollars on their security and they're going to have it a lot more locked down than a small firm in the US, for example. Like oh. I have some firms that, like our firm specifically, I know that we're audited on a yearly basis to make sure we're GDPR compliant, uh, we're SOC 2 audited, um, whereas a lot of firms in the U.S., when you're a small size firm, you can't do that. You just don't have those resources available. Mm -hmm. so, so just for clarity, you're saying that, you know, in actuality, working with your firm, the customer's data may be more secure than an independent who has a smaller firm. I find that very interesting because, you know, uh, many of our members, uh, their customers have said, hey, I'm concerned about the safety, the security of sending my data over to uh, India or the Philippines or wherever, where in actuality, they probably should be more concerned with sending the data down the road. Good point. Exactly. And, and on top of that, to be honest with you, it's uh, a lot of the data isn't even being moved. So hmm. now with like the cloud uses, obviously QuickBooks Online, Xero, um, and then from the tax standpoint, you have UltraTax and even just locally hosted um, tax softwares. A lot of the work is actually being done on the systems that the accountants are using already. So there's no transfer of data a lot of times. I would personally be more concerned if I am moving my data around because then there's more of a concern for pieces of information going missing and and so forth. But there are lots of ways that you can do it where it's going to be stay exactly where it is. So the, cl the cloud-based accounting software security, your additional security, I mean, that's, and we're not moving data. That's right. We're just going and signing into the, the cloud-based uh, logins. Exactly. So it's more about knowing what type of processes your outsourcing firm has from a recruitment perspective to make sure that they are correct properly vetting their employees um, and then making sure they have internal processes to make sure that everything is secure from a physical perspective to make sure they can't have cell phones in the office for example they can't um, log into different social media sites so that they can send information and then also paperless is obviously a huge huge plus for that side of it as well what why do you think they're uh these days there's still that concern um it's just l lack of knowledge lack of education to a point um it's not necessarily something everybody's done especially uh for smaller firms um they haven't necessarily noticed that it's something that they can do because they haven't been taught about it um a lot of big firms have been doing it for a long time long time and it's uh just something that the smaller firms maybe thought that it's something for larger firms to do to keep growing at such a rate. 
but I see so many small firms now growing exponentially, utilizing it. Um, just to give you an idea, I mean, one of our clients specifically, they've got a team of about 50 or 60 people in Texas. They're constantly growing. I mean, it's not like they're outsourcing and now not growing their current staff in-house either. It's that it's so that they can continue to grow and that they don't have to pass up on clients. Um, and they've got a team with 10 with us now. Wow. Um, so it's just really just, and it took off literally within a year or two, they've got 10 with us and they've grown from 30 to 50 over in Texas as well. So, well, and, and you know what, you just re reminded me something. I mean, you, you realize that, uh, well, you and I've spoken in the past before and, and, you know, I have a staffing background, IT staffing, and I've done, uh, importing and exporting all that great stuff of, of talent. Uh, but I, I remember back in 1998, um, working with KPMG and that's where they really started outsourcing, outsourcing the accounting, the back office, the back office, the back office. So, so the outsourced accounting functions were actually happening uh, a little before IT outsourcing, when they were outsourcing the help desk, outsourcing, you know, the managed services, things like that. So, it, you know, it really did trigger in my mind that, yeah, these big boys, you know, they have been doing it for well over a decade here. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it, they've made it into a very process oriented system. So it's very easy to train people that already have very good accounting backgrounds. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I can say that from our, our perspective, we personally get anybody coming into it, they're going to have a master's in accounting or they're going to be qualified accountants. And then it's just about manipulating that and training them more on the US side of it. So we can get very experienced people that have worked with companies like KPMG, Deloitte, PwC, that already have trained them from the account US accounting and US tax perspective. And we can also find CPAs over there as well, both in India. Uh, I'm not certain about the Philippines, but I know in India, you can find CPAs that have worked in the US. Um, so you can get both the low level, but also very high level um, experienced people. You know, this reminds me of the move to Uber and Lyft. I'm surprised mm. by how many people actually still have not used that service. And they're like, it's a stranger picking you up. And there's always, you know, fears. Right. And that's what I'm hearing, Lawrence, in, in this situation is there's this unawareness of what is offered through outsourcing. So there's this fear built up. I think when people convert over to an Uber or Lyft, it's because they went for that first ride. They took a dip. They dipped their toe in the water. How does someone get started with a firm like yours but without taking on extraordinary risk? So there's a couple of different ways. I mean, there are some firms that are definitely out there that will give free trials. Okay. So they'll give you a tester of the service, essentially. I'm sure that that's, that's probably one of the things you should start with. Mm. If possible, try it out for free. Obviously, free is always better um, in that sense. And just go for a quick test run, whether it's a few hours of bookkeeping work, uh, just to make sure you understand the process. Um, and then same thing with the tax side of it. I mean, test out a couple of tax returns. Um, but then you got to think about the perspective you got to think about it from is, can I make this work rather than I'm looking for a perfect project first time? Yes. Because it's very similar to like getting on a new employee. It's going to take a little bit of time. You got to make sure that they understand exactly how you work. And I think that's what differentiates some outsourcing firms. They're the ones that want you to provide them the work and they'll do it their way. And then there are other firms that will adapt to your processes so that you're more comfortable and then you can scale a lot quicker down the line. And you don't need to then make all these changes necessarily. You know, it's interesting. I think people, I, I'll speak for myself. I go in a situation one of two ways. I'll say, how can I find something wrong in this situation? And I'm, that's what my bias is toward. Or to your point, Lawrence, how can I make this work? Or how can I find what's right here? And I think a lot of people that go into something new, whatever the service is, uh, offshore source services, in this case, because they have inexperience, there's fear-based, so they say, well, I got to prove that my fears were right, so what's wrong with this? Oh, it's not perfect experience from the get-go. Now, you said free trials is the way out. I, You guys were kind enough to uh, come to ProfitCon, our annual event. You guys spoke there. You're up on stage. Ron pulled his, Ron's classic for this. You're in the back uh, stage, and Ron will say, hey, um, is there something you can do for our audience? And you're like, oh, we can give an hour free trial. And Ron's like, that's not enough. I need eight hours. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, I think you guys gave an extraordinary amount of free time. Was it eight hours? Do I remember that right? 
Uh, so we give we give about ten hours of bookkeeping. Ten hours, and then, and then about two, like two or three tax returns, depending upon the size of them. Um, and that's, and it, to be honest, that's that's a solid solid day and a half to two days worth of work. And we take it into consideration that that second half of the day is going to go into um, more of the review side of it and feedback that we're going to need from a client yeah. and just a bit of understanding there. So. Yeah, but I think that's an extraordinary way to get started is with a free trial. What about, um, are there other ways to dip the toe in the water or, or, or are there ways to position yourself to make the most progress or have the most success here? Start with smaller clients, start with more flexible clients. What what are some other ideas? Yeah, I think uh, starting with flexible clients is good. Uh, so some, or even just monthly reoccurring clients where you know the process, like the back of your hand, mm. just very simple clients for you now that may not be the most simple overall, but it at least gives you've created a bit of a process behind it. Okay. So now you can then pass it along and sort of see how the outsourcing firm does with those. You can probably provide them some, hopefully some written down procedures to follow um, or provide, I, I always recommend personally to maybe take a screen video of what you're doing or just do a quick video for them and let them know exactly what sort of like a little training in advance, but do it over like a video conference or do it over a Skype call or something like that. Because then one, it can be recorded and documented mm -hmm. so that then the outsourcing firm can then keep that as a training sector. Let's say, for example, if they even need somebody else to work on it that wasn't working on it before, it's it means you don't have to go back and do some work again. Lawrence, it, you just gave GMAP uh, tip right uh 102 which was creating <laughs> video systems and processes yeah, yeah. i mean here we are we're talking about creating a video library for your internal staff yeah. so that they don't have to keep going to you and saying hey mike how do i do this hey right. mike how do i do this right here, exactly well we did it ron you want a video yes please so right. here, here's the video here's the process it's you executing it not only can you replicate that with your overseas partners but that's beauty for when you bring in a new resource locally you oh, already sure. have done it right it's the same knowledge yeah. it's just now a different person may be applying it right um, yeah we use loom I, I don't know zoom no loom mm -hmm. l-o-o-m right loom do you use that at all lawrence uh I, I don't think we've used loom uh i believe we mainly use zoom mm -hmm. and skype personally but Generally speaking, like we are one of those firms that we like to adapt to whatever the software that the accountants are using. So they really send us any video s systems they're using currently. That's what we'll receive and we'll sort of download it and get a gotcha. subscription if needed to make sure we can adapt to that process. So a little tip to our listeners. Zoom is a paid for video conferencing where you can do. Loom is a local free recording software. Mm -hmm. And you can record 10 minutes of video, I think, and then you can just forward it on to whoever. And it tells you once they watch it. Right. Which is kind of cool. Um, uh, okay. So so I like that transfer of knowledge. Let's talk about when the, the wheels start going off the rails because it's going to happen. Not every situation is going to be perfect uh, for every client. What, what can clients do to assure that once they're working with an outsourced firm that the relationship continues to strengthen, that they continue to get momentum? And, and, and also I want to know where do things often get stumbled or, or go off the rails a little bit? So I would say more than often, it's when a client is not co like communicating yeah. with the outsourcing partner. They haven't really set their goals and expectations for a, a project. They haven't provided the accountant enough information to do the project. And it may, sometimes it's actually that the end, the end client and not the accountant um, hasn't mm. necessarily provided all the information. Um, and but it's that the accountant hasn't necessarily communicated that then with the outsourcing firm. So it's really, really important. Like they're vitally important that a very good line of communication is set up from day one. It's right. so just, don't, just so like in your office. You can't, you can't work with an employee and not talk to them uh, whatsoever or give them any training. It's not going to work. Yeah, right. and don't give your outsourced partner a customer that has been traditionally not getting you the information that you need. That's a good point, yeah. You right. know, I mean, that's what I think Lawrence was saying is sometimes it's not the accounting firm, it's the actual end user of the services, you know, so pick and choose your customers wisely. Does this apply to, you know, we're saying accounting firms, what about bookkeepers? We have a lot of bookkeepers listening. Can they use services like this? 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, bookkeeping, bookkeeping again is one of those ones that can scale very quickly. They've got there's a huge need for bookkeepers in the US. Um, I, I see bookkeeping firms that have grown very quickly, um, especially in New Jersey, uh, where we are. Like they're growing very, very quickly, and it's they just need resources though. And I think there's there's a couple of ways that some of the firms that I know have been doing it, and one is outsourcing, um, and the second one is employing um, sort of stay-at-home moms and dads that uh, that have the accounting background but maybe need to do stuff virtually now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's other options that people have gone into, but they're generally more on a part-time basis. Yeah. Um, so it then limit, limits the amount of it limits the amount of end clients that they can really have as an account manager, for example. You know, one of the things uh, I think with outsourcing is we can determine our participation level. I, you know, I'm an accountant or a bookkeeper. I, I want to be pretty much hands off or I want to be more involved. Um, but that mean maybe that's what I want, but maybe that doesn't work with an outsourcing firm. How can I throttle my involvement? What's the best way to manage that so that we are getting the results we want? And what are the consequences if I'm involved less than yeah. uh, than more? So I would say that's that's one of my pointers in terms of in the pl- in our planning stage. So that's something that really needs to be looked into. And okay. um, do you want to be, how involved do you want to be? Do you want to be very involved with this, very hands-on, understand the ABC of everything to do with the outsourcing operation and process? Do you want to just be able to pass on everything and let go completely? Or do you want to be a little bit involved here and there, still understand the clients and everything, and it's um, and you're going to be now more of a reviewer role? rather than an owner of the firm and just physically working completely on the business rather than in it. So they're the, they're the sort of three options. And if you want to be completely hands-off then and just like an owner, you want to grow the business, you don't really want to deal in the nitty-gritty operational side of it, you have to be able to dedicate a project leader for it. So you have to make sure okay. that somebody is going to be driving this outsourcing or driving... Um, the projects to make sure it's working and reporting then to you to keep you at least updated about it um, because without somebody that is on board with it, it's not going to work. So that's uh, that's another uh, insider access slash GMAP tip is having somebody who owns it. That's what we do here. Your point, o- yeah. o- owns owns the initiative. They're responsible for the success or the failure of the initiative, and they're responsible for you know generating the support. Okay, from the other individuals that are going to be potentially utilizing or working the initiative as well. So yeah, having a singular person that's going to own it is is paramount to almost any initiative. I have a uh, a painting of George Washington at my house and it's a it's a quote. Oh, I thought it. that was your dad. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Um it is my father. Um and there's a quote on it and he says I found uh in my years of leadership that when a task is assigned to one person it gets done, when it's assigned to two it's finger pointing and when it's assigned to three it'll never get done. Now it's a paraphrasing of it. But um hey, let me ask you this Lawrence, what about the country I pick? If I want to offshore this what are there pro- I know you focus on India, but is there pros and cons to India versus Armenia versus the Philippines versus yeah. Brazil? Versus yeah, Brazil. I mean, this. You better I, tell us about I know country or travel. My specialty is in the Indian side. Okay. I can I can say from being there, I physically been there um, a few times. The first time was for about three months, um, and then I went there for another three weeks, um, and I'll be going there again, um, hopefully in March this year as well to do our annual day, mm-hmm. um, but. So I can give that background. I know that I would say on a language side, and it's a lot easier to understand people in the Philippines. That's what feedback I've got from other outsourcing firms and other firms that are using outsourcing firms in the Philippines. Okay. I would say the language is better. And if you're doing very basic bookkeeping, that is an option for you. Yeah. Um, it sounds like the skill set isn't quite there from a higher level perspective. There just yeah. isn't as many larger firms necessarily using them in that area and training them up to that size um, and knowledge base. And that's where India sort of comes in. They're more of, I would say, they're very, very well educated. Like it's so highly densely populated in the areas. It's very competitive on the educational perspective and they get very high degrees there deliberately just to even get jobs. 
Mm. Um, so, but again, I'm sure in, in Brazil as well, if you've got, let's say in the U S there's obviously a very high population of, uh, Spanish speaking people. So that can be Brazil is probably a very good area there is if, if you've got a lot of Spanish clients, um, they're probably a better option because then you've got that language as well that you can go to them and I'm, they'll be speaking Spanish and it's going to be a lot easier to, on the communication point of view. And Brazil, Brazil has a time zone too, right? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. What about the time zone differences? And the yeah, benefits? I mean, uh, there are time zone differences. Now, it again, it depends on the firm. Um, like we personally have about an 18 hour um, a day where we have people in the office. So like we work until 3 p.m. Eastern time and then we start up again at about 9 p.m. Eastern time. So we oh. only have a few hours in the day where we're not, we don't have accountants in the office and available to clients. Um, I'm sure there are going to be firms that are 24 hours as well. And there are going to be firms that are um, just working specifically their shift timings. So that's an important factor to look into. Like, do you want somebody that is available to you throughout your day? Do you want somebody that is available overnight for you so that you can prepare projects for them, get a list of projects for them one day, have them do them, and then they're on your desk in the morning where you can now review and answer their questions? What about that's a good process? Yeah. What about consistency with the individual that's doing the work as it's becoming more and more competitive uh, for talent, even over in India? And, you know, what what type of attrition um, is happening there? I mean, am I going to be working with uh, one great guy one day and then somebody else the next month then the next month? I mean, how are things going over there? Yeah, so it, ha- it happens. I mean, nutrition happens sort of all over the world. Um, I would say that it depends on the type of, like for ourselves, it depends on the type of account that you sign up for. So if you go for more of a managed model, then it's you have to rely on the company itself. Like you want to rely on QX. Don't think about the person doing it. Rely on the company is going to get you a good project done. Hmm. Now, if it's, you can go a different model where you are essentially purchasing a seat. So like you're renting a place for your employee to sit and then you can be more hands-on in terms of you can help with the screening of the candidates and actually pick the person that you want. You provide a job description and then the companies go out and recruit for you. Now that is more of your employee then. Really, you've been hands-on in picking that person and that is where you can have a lot more control on that matter but then also again they could leave the company for whatever reason and then you now have to go and find somebody else which is goes back to what we mentioned earlier about video recording a lot of your training sessions like do that and it is a lot easier from that point of view if you lose somebody at least you've got those videos that now it's going to be easier to train and you don't just want one person realistically if you have a team you're not going to feel that hit if one person leaves. What about the uh, feedback? How should I be communicating with my outsource firm to help improve the outcomes? And then is there a point I can go too far and actually become detrimental? Um, I would say it's a bit of a mixture. So it's um, you have to you have to give feedback. Like it's just like like we mentioned earlier with the employees. Like it's you've got to give some feedback so that they know they're on the right track. You've got to set goals with their management team as well so that they know what you're really looking to do. Um, And then they can follow more of a timeline going forward so they can make sure that they're providing feedback and we can go back and forth and let each other know like if we're not receiving enough, if we are receiving enough feedback and but give them time to actually learn your process. That's the big thing. If If you're just saying, okay, here's the problem, fix it rather than here's what I do in my office. Can we do it this way? You have to give some, it's a, it's a give and take. You can't just rely on them solely. You have to be able to back up what you're doing in your office because you're going to struggle to scale if you can't teach somebody else what you're currently doing. Right, right, exactly. Now, what would you say it would be, in your opinion, the, the, the number one or two reasons why you people are not moving forward with 
outsourcing. You have a conver- you, you know, you have conversations with firms. Some move forward with you. Some don't move forward. Why? Why do you think firms are not moving forward? So number one is um, lack lack of education in the outsourcing industry. Okay. In terms of those those sort of scale or uh, uh, scare factors, what we talked about earlier, like why are people afraid of it? And it's because it's happened in the past and people have had some very great good results some people have had some very bad results and whenever the bad results come up then it's they're the bits that scare people okay and it's um and again it's one of those things like you said with uber and lyft like people just don't try it because they're scared of change and they're scared of new things Mm -hmm. You, you have to be willing to change i mean the industry is changing so quickly um, we're going, becoming so much more automated anyway, and just technology has improved so much that you cannot become 100% secure. There's no way over the internet, like you cannot become 100% secure. I have people in IT security firms telling me that there is not a chance. The only way to secure a computer fully is by putting it in a safe, locking it up, Dropping it in the middle of the ocean. Yeah, not and using putting it. Putting your computer in there <laughs> and not, never using it. Then it is secure. Well, I think um, a, a major indication, too, of why people may not be moving forward is because the, the our, from our membership perspective, just let's just say our average member firm is, you know, 250 to 500,000 uh, in revenue. Uh, they have one or two or three employees, and they've tried an onshore staffing firm. Okay, near shaft. They've looked for an agency, whether it's Robert Half, whether it's what, whoever it happens to be. And my experience is that these larger staffing firms don't cater to that small market. Okay, it's a lot easier Correct. for them to get the higher bill rate out of a KPMG or you know Eisner or something like that versus cater there. So what I've seen in the past, and, and maybe you can you know support this, is that when a a, a lot of times the smaller accounting bookkeeping firms have a very negative image of staffing firms in general because they've never been properly serviced. So when that happens, well, outsourcing is staffing when it comes into it, but it's staffing offshore. Now, you know, do you, do you think that, that because the big boys haven't necessarily catered to the um, smaller firms that that's an additional factor as to why outsour- they're afraid of outsourcing? Yeah, I mean, and they're, and they're having to pay that recruitment firm generally at least 15, 20% of 50, whatever that salary 50% is. markups on those boys. You yeah, know? there you go. So it's, uh, it's and that's, that's a big cost to a smaller firm, especially if you're just like, let's say you're a sole proprietor and you're just getting your first employee on mm-hmm. and you, you want to do it in advance. Let's say you're a forward thinker and you're, you're not quite at 100% capacity or you're just reaching it. Now you take somebody on. That's a good time to take somebody on. Otherwise, you're going to start losing opportunities from taking on new clients. If you're already at 50 hours, um, 50 hours a week, you may start losing those uh, prospects. You may start not being able to provide for your current clients enough. Um, you're also going to lose a bit of family time. These are all these are all major things that obviously you don't want, you don't want to. I mean, you want to be a lifestyle accountant like we've seen on on a bunch of shows as well, where you, you have a life with your family. Like that's a, that's really the end goal is to have as much time and provide for your family. And in order to do so, you can't necessarily fork out fifteen twenty percent to have a recruiter find somebody for you. But also, you don't want to be working eighty hours, seventy hours a week because you're not going to have that life. Well, in addition, I mean, even on the low end, you know, paying a staffing firm twenty five, thirty bucks an hour for a bookkeeper or accountant, you know, the the employee is probably getting anywhere from twenty to whatever, uh, give or take here and then. And then if they don't work out after three months, you're you're, you're basically looking at you know twenty five dollars an hour times you know one hundred and sixty hours in, in a, a 
month times three, that's a mm-hmm. lot of money on something that didn't go well. So, you know, my advice to our listeners here is even if you had a bad experience in the past, um, you know, the tips that we're sharing and Lawrence is sharing, you know, I'm recommending give it a try again. Right. The industry has changed. Yeah, the industry has changed. Hey, Lawrence, uh, because we got to start wrapping things up. You've been in this industry so long. Do you have any really juicy stories for us, like a real big success and or like like someone doing something crazy like, hey, I I ordered pizza and it never came. Like, do you have any crazy stories that you can share? Crazy stories, um, crazy success or crazy failure, but I just want to get. All right, I mean, uh, from from the success side, uh, which I, I would say again, I wasn't I wasn't sort of expecting this sort of scale or anything like that. There was, um, it's actually from the Canadian side. Um, two years ago, we got on a firm that specializes in working with U.S. expats that are in. Uh, Canada. Oh my! Okay. So um, it's it's a slightly complicated work, but it's it's more they just and they, again they can't find the resources in Canada um, because you need that U.S. experience as well. Right. So we started working with them. They started with a team of four um, two years ago, and they touched. So they've just I just got a report from them, and they were up to eighteen people in our office. Wow. Um, and so I don't know how That's many they've gross. got in their office now, but. It just the, the amount of growth they had in two years is absolutely ridiculous from my side. It's um, it was clearly a huge business for it in Canada, and uh, so it's been so it's been great from that standpoint. Uh, I wouldn't say crazy. It's not quite like any pizza stories or anything no, like no, that, that you have. Um, but <laughs> still, that's that's a remarkable story. That that shows the opportunity that exists. Yeah, if someone has the maybe it's still just a little bit of courage to take that first step in. All right, Lawrence, we got to rock, uh, rock and roll. It's always a joy. Uh, you guys have been wonderful supporters of our ProfitCon. Last year, people were raving about you. And, Ron, you were saying, how many of our members are working with QX County? I, I, I think probably around 15 to 20, give 15 or 15 to 20 people. Yeah, yeah. actively. And they're they're utilizing uh, Lawrence's services at different levels. Some are bookkeeping, some are tax, some are more complex tax. And some of them now for years, yeah, over year, year. year right? Yeah, yeah. Year some have year. three, some have four. You know, so. Those are the early adopters. There's a lot of opportunity there. All right, Lawrence. Um, well, thanks for that. Before we let you go, how can people learn more about you and QX Accounting specifically? Yes, yeah, so, I mean you can reach out to um, reach out through our website. So we've got a chat feature on there. Um, so that's www.qxas. Dot us dot com. You guys can probably repeat that for me because uh, some people mix up my letters um, occasionally. Okay. So that um, is www.qxas.us.com. Make sure you tell definitely. them that Ron and Mike sent you, though. Yes, definitely. Cool. All right, Lawrence. Thanks for uh, joining us today. We'll talk to you later. It's been great, guys. All right, I'll see you guys awesome. later. Awesome. See you later. See you later. Bye. That's um, <laughs> Chewy. Oh, the guys from England love that. They love a Chewbacca sound. <laughs> um, all right, Ron. Well, we're going to recap what we learned. You know the routine. I just want to make yeah. sure our guests do. We're going to recap what we learned. We are going to uh, have, do you have an insider access for us? I do. Good. I do. And we'll do the GMAP now task. But first, mm-hmm. oh, my mouse got L- stuck. A little slow on the sting. I, I swang, swang, swung S- swung. the mouse over. And it hit my keyboard, and I was unable to get you to it. You got the... some setup over there, too. Yeah, people have to see this. Like, there's monitors everywhere. There's a little peak hole. So and you're wearing your you. Bono glasses. Oh, so the story behind this. Yeah. I presented at a conference called uh, Grow Door Live. Okay. And what Grow Door is, is these property management firms. The more doors that you have. Oh, okay. Sure, I got that's it. That's why I call it. it. Um, and the guy goes up there, and he's wearing, the host is wearing these Bono glasses, and, and for our listeners, bono glasses are sunglasses that are tinted in yellow. a yellow or orange. And it wraps around your head a little bit, mm-hmm. right? So it's side to side. So people are making fun of him and stuff. And uh, I come down, I'm like, what's the deal? He's like, oh, those are the modern version of blue blockers. I don't know if you remember. Yeah, those yeah, 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 yeah. He goes, it reduces eye fatigue significantly. And guys like me and you, actually many of our listeners, you're in front of the computer constantly. Yes. So he mails me a copy. He's like, dude, I'm telling you, this is a game changer. So he sent them to me, and I've been us- using them. No question, impact on the eye fatigue. There's definitely less. Yeah, you wear them often. Yeah, now, now, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I only got them back a couple of weeks ago, but I'm, I'm wearing it for the entire day. 
less eye strain. So and it's also fun to make fun of. Yeah, it looks ridiculous. <laughs> it looks ridiculous. <laughs> I can't deny the ridiculous looking this. They probably look worse on me. All right, Ron. So why don't we thank our corporate partners first? Yes, thank you, Receipt Bank, the ultimate productivity saving tool. It's an app, one of my favorite apps. We use it all the time. Yep. Basically, snap a picture of the receipt, boom, sends it in there. Prevents uh, our bookkeeper from calling me and asking me, "Run, where's the receipt for this? Run, where's the receipt for this?" And it saves me money because they don't have to key the crap in there. And can you imagine when one of your clients gets audited? Like that's the, the biggest nightmare for anyone, but it does happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and when they get audited, you have to produce the receipts. It's a great storage tool specific for this instead of going through that shoebox. Yeah, so uh, and receipts seem to fade over time. Do you notice they that? They do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They get all crumpled up. The ink doesn't stay well. You yeah, know. yeah. So this thing obviously is permanent preservation. The other one is Nextiva. Oh, yeah. So Nextiva is a voice over IP phone system. Um, they are an extraordinary firm, first and foremost. And the funny thing is you don't hear that too often. Everyone argues about features and benefits. Let me start off by saying Nextiva is an extraordinary company. Mm-hmm. Um, there is so much PR out there about them and the things they're doing to impact their community, our community. But it's backed by an extraordinary tool, which is a voice over IP phone system. Uh, you can't beat the price and you can't beat the quality. Uh, and we now have, I think, 20, 25. Who of knows? Those. Yeah. It's just growing. It's yeah, ridiculous. it's kind of like crack candy. I've got, you know? I've got some in the trunk of my car that I give out. Really? Yeah, it's no. like you, you can't help but like, <laughs> first hey, one's free. Hey, man, you want me to call? Right, first one's free until you're addicted. You want me to call? <laughs> That's funny. All right, Ron, um, why don't we t- talk about what we learned first? Do mm-hmm. you want to go? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so so what what I learned is not, not necessarily anything new since being in staffing, but it was a good... Um, um, support that you have to be involved with this. You, you, you can't just say, okay, here you go, make it happen. I mean, if you want to do that, well, then you can do that, but you, you got to understand that you have to allow them to do their job. Yeah, don't interfere. Don't interfere, right? But also, if you, if you haven't had good success hiring on your own, um, if you haven't been able to recruit the talent that you need, the, if the staffing firms have let you down, Try it. Yeah, I mean, think about the cost and time just to find someone. Yeah. You, you could literally have someone working for you by the end of today by outsourcing. Yes, versus, yes. You know, through hiring. Here's the three I took away. Um, first of all, it's a competitive advantage for small firms. Typically, the small firms are the early adopters doing this stuff. Yeah. But Lawrence is like, no, the big firm's been doing this for 10 years now. Um, More, yeah. Yeah, so use a small firm. If you want to stay in the ballpark of competition, you need to do this, and the other small firms aren't. I thought that was interesting. Mm-hmm. Second thing he said... Understand, this is your employee. He kind of said it between sentences, but that was the big aha to me. Like, you're not, this is not a firm that's working for you. Uh, at least that's not how you should see it. It's like hiring an employee. There's a training and, and orientation process you need to go through. And the third takeaway was you need to have that liaison at your office. This is not an abdication. Ah, you know, yeah, 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 gotta yeah. Somebody's got to own it. Someone's got to own it. Well, something else that someone's got to own oh. is that, that, that lightsaber yes. you got there. Yes, awesome. This is Insider Access. This is what something we got going on here at Prop First Professionals HQ, or we call mm-hmm. it HB, home base, and Ron's bringing it to you. What do you got to Yep, say, absolutely. So one of the things, and it's very timely, that's why I picked this one, is our Insider Access. You know, we want to have a very unique job posting. Okay. Yes. And and one of the things that I, I see is is a lot of generic job postings out there. And wh- when I say unique, people try to be unique by sharing their culture. Yeah. We have a great culture. We have this. We have that. But it's it's just it's just words. They're not demonstrating yes. in the actual job description yeah. that their culture is truly unique and distinct. Yeah. So the example in our job description, we're actually looking for a brand ambassador. So any of you guys. Are know anybody that wants to help uh, message and share the profit first uh, methodology and brand out there we are hiring and, and for that somebody could be even you could be even you absolutely and so but if you look at that job description it'll have in there that we actually blast guns and roses that we right. you know that we we bring some of the personality of individuals right. where we'll have somebody who actually likes to sing we'll declare what they are or even the fact that you may get hit with a dart gun yeah 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 here. Here. Not not a real dark gun, but a Nerf dark gun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, and so that's different, and you're actually demonstrating your culture in the job description versus saying we have a unique and fun and a- atmosphere. I love that. Boom. You know, one thing we're doing too uh, is we too are always trying to up level our game. 
I just heard recently a company that in their ad, they have a link and it goes to a recruitment page and it's the recruiter. It says, hey, listen, yep. I'm the guy who's going to be your boss. So let me introduce myself mm-hmm. as opposed to only seeing text. Yep. That's so, interesting. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Always ways to up level and be different. I love that, Ron. Thank Great. you. Uh, there's one more thing. This is called the GMAP <laughs> Now task. And you already got a bunch of tasks yeah. earlier today. Yeah, exactly. But this is the one thing that will have immediate impact. It's easy, it's quick, and it's a game changer! Three, two, Rocky, bum, bum, push bum, it. Bum. Smash it. Bum, bum, bum. Get that new employee. Bum, bum, bum. Bum. Okay. <laughs> So, ridiculous. Yeah, I know. That's so stupid. It is. <laughs> but listen, I get, I, we, the reason we get jacked about this is because it's- <laughs> Shit it's, works. This shit works. And it's small, little steps done deliberately. Not, not, there's some point you got to stop thinking and you got to start doing. So we always want to give you something you can do. Super simple. When it comes to outsourcing, here's the first small step. If you ever, again, say, I need another me, like, oh, I just could have another me, Ugh. that is the indicator that you need to outsource. But the mistake is trying to look for someone of your caliber. Mm-hmm. There's going to be, there is, there's only one you. There's only someone as committed as the owner, someone that has all that knowledge. So the first step is to take away the most distracting work. So with the next time you say, I need another me, I want to ask one more question. Oh. What do I hate to do most? Yep. That's the first thing to outsource. And maybe it is a firm like QX, but maybe it's just hiring a personal assistant yes. over you know Craigslist. But that is all outsourcing. Or a content writer for marketing or yes. whatever. What's the thing you don't like to do? Make that your first outsource, and then you've been now you're introduced to the game of outsourcing. Awesome. Okay. Boom. Um, that's also a boom for the lightsaber. We don't boom every time because it's such a long boom. <laughs> well, Mike, what another great episode. Thank you, Lawrence, for the knowledge. And thank you, listeners. Uh, you can, of course, review us, provide feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and we'd love to hear your feedback. Yeah, and um, we would love for you to check out Profit First Professionals. You know, we're proud of our organization and the impact we're having. Profit First is unequivocally the number one brand in the world on profit. Entrepreneurs know about it. They just need help from professionals, accountants, bookkeepers, coaches. So if you're an accountant, bookkeeper, coach who wants to distinguish yourself in the market by offering a consulting service around profitability, something that no one else can do, well, we may be a match made in heaven. You got to take the first step, though. Go So go to ProfitFirstProfessionals.com, click on B1, and we'll have a conversation. If it's a fit, we're off to the races, and we're eradicating entrepreneurial poverty together and making you very profitable as a result. Absolutely. Cool. All right, let's get out of here, Ron. Awesome. See ya.